So I don't, I, it's kind of weird. I always struggle with this because I always want to think of something new to say to you. I want to think of something, I don't know, cool, maybe leave you with something that you haven't heard before. And tonight isn't one of those nights. I, I don't want to say anything new to you. In fact, tonight I just want to remind you of things that you already know. I want to remind you of things that maybe you've forgotten, because I think we are a very forgetful people. Uh, like some of us, we struggle with what we had for with what we had for breakfast on Monday that we don't remember anymore. So tonight, only thing I want to do is to remind you of things that you know already to be true about Jesus and to be true uh, about you. And the one thing I want to say is this. Uh, being physically hungry is terrible. Uh, to starve to death physically is one of the worst deaths you can experience. And you know that already. You know that starvation is bad. I, I want to tell you when I realized how bad dying of starvation uh, is. I was in college. I was over at Liberty University, and I was in the library, and I was doing this research on Ethiopia, and I was reading about the starvation on the level of poverty in that country. And I remember I was reading the story about this photographer, and this is what happened. This guy, he's a photographer, and he goes to Ethiopia, and he sees this vulture. You guys know what a vulture is, right? Uh, what do vultures eat? They eat dead things. They go to carcasses. This vulture was plump. This vulture was fat. Like, the vulture was so fat that like, he couldn't fly. Like, he was, like, walking, right? It was like he was at an all-you-can-eat buffet. And the thing that the vulture was walking after, it was this little girl. She was like three years old, and you can tell that she was starving because the guy, he took a picture. It was like a National Geographic magazine book, and you could tell this girl, she was just crawling and crawling, and this vulture was just walking behind this girl, and the guy took the picture of that, of that little girl who was starving, and that vulture that was fat, and he wept. He wept, and it says that uh, years later, he took his life. Because he saw the level of starvation in Ethiopia. He saw how bad it was in Africa. That he saw people literally starving to death. And it was something he couldn't get out of his mind. As ugly as it is to starve physically, it is much worse to starve spiritually. It is much worse to starve emotionally. That as we go into John chapter 4, uh, we're talking about being thirsty spiritually, and we're talking about being hungry spiritually. And last week we dealt with spiritual thirst, and we said that the answer to spiritual thirst is authentic worship of Jesus. Uh, tonight we're going to find out how do we, how do we uh, handle spiritual hunger. Uh, pray with me one more time. Uh, dear Jesus, as we go into your word, please meet us where we are, that as horrible as that picture is of that little girl who starved physically, you would stare at some of us and you would say it's just as bad. That spiritually we're no better off than she was. I pray tonight you would, you would help us to see what we need to do to take care of our spiritual hunger and our emotional hunger. We give this prayer in your name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go to John chapter 4. And if you're in John chapter 4, it's going to be verse 27. So John 4 verse 27. And what's happened so far, uh, you have Jesus, he's in Samaria, 
he's talking to the woman at the well. They have this discussion about spiritual thirst, and then she realizes that Jesus is the Messiah, and that brings us over to verse 27. So John chapter 4, verse 27, and it says this. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the, woman, uh, so the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they, then they went out of the city and were coming to him. So what do we get from these verses? It's this, that Jesus is talking to this woman, and the disciples, they come to Jesus, and they're amazed. They're like, why is he talking to her? Well, what's going on here? This isn't right. Because in that culture, and in that time period, a rabbi, that Jesus, he's a rabbi, he's a religious leader, that rabbis didn't speak to women one-on-one, that that didn't happen, and yet Jesus is going against cultural norms, that Jesus Jesus says, I don't care what you think, that Jesus says, I'm going to talk to this woman because she needs someone to reach out to her. That Jesus got out of his comfort zone and Jesus says, I will talk to someone that no one else will talk to. That Jesus says, I don't care what you think about me. I know that this person is made in the image of God and I have to reach out to her, that Jesus went out of his comfort zone to reach someone. And then some of you would say, well, maybe Jesus was comfortable. Maybe this wasn't that big of a deal to him. Well, let me remind you of something that Jesus did do that really got him out of his comfort zone, that he went to the cross And, you know, when we say that Jesus went to the cross, that really doesn't affect you, right? That really doesn't bother you. It doesn't shake your heart the way that it should. Because why? Because we have cross earrings. uh, We have cross necklaces. uh, A cross in our sanctuary. So you see the cross, and it doesn't faze you at all. Well, if we had uh, electric chair earrings or an electric chair necklace, right, you would think that's goth. You think that that's not right. Well, that, that's weird. Or if we had, a, you know, a needle, right? It was like lethal injection needles, like, hanging from our necks, right? You say that's, why would you do that? Well, in the first century, the cross represented death. That, does anyone know how you would die by crucifixion? Does anyone know the, the real secret behind it? Okay, Liberty, how would you die by crucifixion? Yeah, it's like stuff flowing into your lungs that you would die by suffocation. Ian, you're going to say something? You can't support yourself. Because this is what they did. Does anyone know who started the practice of, of, cruci- of crucifixion? It wasn't the Romans. It was the Phoenicians. That the Phoenicians started crucifixion and the Romans perfected it. That what the Phoenicians start, the Romans said we can do better. That this is what they would do. They would take nails and they would drill it right here into this nerve. And it would cause the utmost pain. And then they would take your feet and they would drag a nail there. You would literally, in order to breathe, you would have to pull yourself up. And in order to do that, it would be excruciating pain. So your choice is this, to suffocate or to pull yourself up and feel excruciating pain, and each breath for the rest of your life would be that way. And here's the thing, if someone broke your legs, would you think that's kindness? No, if someone broke your legs on the cross, it was kind. That if you were on the cross and some Roman soldier broke your legs, he was doing you a favor because he was ending your pain. That the cross was such a barbaric way to die that a Roman historian, uh, he wrote this, that the cross should be far from every Roman's mind. That the cross should never enter the mind of a Roman because it is such a barbaric death. That if you were a Roman citizen, they legally could not crucify you because that's how ugly that death was. And yet that's the death that Jesus went through for me and you. 
that Jesus definitely went out of his comfort zone because he was praying in the garden. Remember that? Before he was crucified, before, the, before he was taken away, that he's praying in the garden, and he said that he sweated. His sweat was like drops of blood. It's not saying that his sweat was literally drops of blood, but he says that he sweat so intensely, it was like he was bleeding. That Jesus says, if there's any possible way, if there's any other way, let's do something else. But then he said, not my will, but your will be done. That Jesus faced the most barbaric death that anyone could face. And yet, if you read the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus had joy. That the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. What made Jesus happy about the cross? When Jesus is literally pulling himself up to breathe, what brings him happiness? It was you. It was you. That when Jesus was on the cross, pulling himself up in unimaginable pain, Jesus thought about you, and that brought him happiness. What does that say how valuable you are? How valuable, how valuable are you that when Jesus was going through the most horrific death imaginable, he thought of you and he smiled. That you mean a lot to Jesus. That your self-worth is found in Christ. That some of you, you don't think anyone loves you. You don't think anyone cares about you. Yet Jesus says you are worth the most painful death imaginable. You are worth it. Like I said, I don't want to say anything new to you tonight. I just want to remind you of things you already know. That Jesus says you are so valuable that Jesus went out of his comfort zone for you. Which brings this question, what, what about us? What about me? What about you? Or are we willing to get out of our comfort zone for Jesus? What does that look like, getting out of your comfort zone for Jesus? That, it would look like this. You know when someone's getting picked on and someone's getting bullied, instead of you just going into the crowd, that you would say, no, that's not right. That you would stand up for other people that no one stands up for. Uh, getting out of your comfort zone, for some of you, that means signing up and going to Urban Hope. That, can I tell you, Urban Hope is not my comfort zone. Uh, there's nothing comfortable about it for me. And that's why I need to go. That going t up to a homeless man and talking to him about the gospel is one of the last things I want to do. And yet Jesus is there that Jesus encourages me and you to get out of our comfort zone and meet him there. That verse we read before I got up here, it was uh, Jesus walking on the water, and the disciples, they're all in this boat, and they are terrified. They think it's a ghost they're seeing, right, walking on the water, and yet Jesus says, it's me, right? It's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter said, if it's you, let me come out and talk to you. Let me walk over to you. And Jesus says, come, right? That all the disciples are scared, and yet only one disciple is willing to get out of the boat to meet Jesus, to get out of his comfort zone. That some of you, you don't feel close to Christ at all. And here's why. It's not that you're not saved. You're, it's you're saved, but you don't leave your comfort zone. That when you first get saved, Jesus meets you where you're at. Wherever you are, Jesus will meet you where you're at to save your soul, to save your life. Right? So you're close to Jesus. And then Jesus, he wants you to grow. So Jesus, he starts saying, hey, let's go this way. Hey, let's go here. And you're trying to say, uh, I'd rather not go there. Right? Can, can we just stay here? I feel safe here. And yet Jesus says, I'm right here outside of your comfort zone. Will you meet me? 
And here's the wonderful thing. When Peter got out of the boat, and as he was walking on the water, did he fall in? Yeah, Peter failed. Peter failed. But yet Jesus was right there to pick him up. It's okay to fail getting out of your comfort zone because Jesus is there to meet you. The question is, are you willing to do it or not? And this doesn't mean doing stupid things for Jesus, right? Because sometimes some people, you, you think that getting out of your comfort zone is just being this risk taker that doesn't think of anything. Well, that, that's not it either. Uh, when Jesus uh, encountered the devil in the wilderness, uh, Satan took Jesus to the highest part of the temple, and he says, if you truly are the Son of God, throw yourself off this temple. And Jesus says, uh, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That getting out of your comfort zone, it doesn't mean doing stupid things for Jesus. It, 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 it's like this. If a van shows up, right, if a white van shows up and says, hey, can you help me? Well, it's, okay, it's probably not the Culp's van, right? Because if it's not, if there's a white van and it's not the Culp's and a guy says, hey, can you help me? Don't go to the van, right? Don't do stupid things for Jesus. It means this, though. It means the Holy Spirit leads you, Right? Taking, getting out of your comfort zone for Jesus is that the Holy Spirit leads you. And we're told this. Jesus says this. Uh, be as innocent as a dove, but be as wise as a serpent. That Jesus doesn't call you to do stupid things for him. But Jesus says this. As I lead you, as you're following me, get out of your comfort zone. And let's do this work together. Jesus was willing to get out of his comfort zone to reach you. Are you willing to get out of your comfort zone to reach others? Which brings us over to verse 31. Uh, look at it with me. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and that he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. That the disciples, they see Jesus and they say, hey, get something to eat. Hey, here's some bread. Hey, here's some food. Uh, eat this. And Jesus says, I have food that you do not know about. And the disciples are all thinking, dude, who gave him something to eat? And Jesus says, the food for me is to do the will of my father. That Jesus says that the food I really need for life is to do the work my father gave me. How do you satisfy, how do you stop the spiritual and the emotional hunger in your life? You stop that by doing God's will. You stop the hunger in your life by doing God's will. By doing the work that God has given you and that stops the spiritual hunger in your life that once again, we can go back to the whole temptation story of Jesus. And Jesus, he's in the desert. And how long did he fast in the desert? 
40 days and 40 nights. He has nothing to eat, and Satan shows up, and Satan says this, hey, if you're really the son of God, if you're really who people say you are, why don't you turn to God? And Jesus, he's physically hungry. He looks at Satan, and he says this, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word God, that Jesus says, as hungry as I am physically, it's better for me not to be spiritually hungry. That, have you ever been something called hangry? Right? You're, you're hungry and you're angry all at the same time, right? And that's only because you're physically hungry. And you know when you're hangry, no one wants to be around you? Right, because you are like a jerk. Like you are mean when you're hangry. Right? It, imagine how you are spiritually. That some of you are spiritually hangry. Right? Because you are starving spiritually, you're a better person. That you have all this anger inside of you, and you're confused because you said, "I thought I trusted Christ." I really think I'm a Christian, but yet I have all this anger inside of me. I have all this bitterness operating inside of me. Where does all that come from? It's because you're not doing what God has called you to do. That some of you, uh, well, I guess the question is this. What is God's will for your life, right? Well, first, well, is God's will, what does that even look like? Uh, go to Romans chapter 12. And look over at verses 1 and 2, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verse 2. And this is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That Paul says this, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That he say this, take this, take everything that you are physically and say this, God, take my life. God, use me, right? God, do something with my life that I can't. Have you done that? Once again, this is nothing new. I'm simply reminding you of things you already know to be true, that your life should be given to the service of God. And then Paul says this, if you give your life over to God, Paul says this about God's will. He says that God's will, it's good, it's acceptable, it's perfect. That God's individual will for your life, God's plan for your life, God's, what God wants to do in your life, what God wants to accomplish in your life as an individual, it's good, it's acceptable, it's perfect. So once again, how do you discover this? How do you discover God's will for you? It's two things, two things you have to do. Love God with all your heart. Love God with everything you are and love other people. That God says this, you want to know my will for your life. You want, to, you want me to show you what to do. God says this, love me, love others. That if you never get those two things, if you don't get the idea of loving God with everything you are, and you don't get the idea of loving, like God is looking for this. God is looking for people that will love him, and God is looking for people that will love others. If you don't get those two things, you'll never get God. 
You, nothing I say will make sense unless in your heart and in your mind you resolve those two things. Love God, love others. As you do those two things, God is going to show you what to do. That your spiritual hunger is going to be satisfied because you're going to say this, God, what can I do for you to show that I love you? And God, what can I do to show that I love other people? For some of you, it means this, that you go to Haiti and you go to Haiti because you love God and you love others. Some of you, you go on Operation Barnabas to show that you love God and you love others. Some of you, it's city life because you love God and you love others. Others of you, it's the Great Commission Bible Institute because you love God, you love others. For some of you, it's going to urban hope to show that you love God and you love others. And you don't have to go to all those different places that God's work is here. God's work for you can be in this very room that to reach out to someone that no one else will. That Jesus says this. Look at, he's, he's like, look at the world. He's like, it is ripe for harvest, right? That God is looking for laborers. God is looking for people to go out into the field to work. But yet people don't go. Why? Because they don't love God and they don't love others. And the spiritual hunger exists in their life. And God says, if you would love me and if you would love other people, I could satisfy the hunger that goes deep down into your heart and into your soul. What about you? Which brings me to my, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to my last point. Uh, go back to John chapter 4. And look over in verse 39. And this is, this is what it says. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two more days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That this woman, when we first met her in John chapter 4, she's an outcast. Uh, she's the wrong gender. She's the wrong religion. Uh, she's an outcast to outcast, that no one wants to talk to her, that people say, get away from me, that she has to do life by herself. She meets Jesus, and in one conversation, Jesus radically transforms her life, that this woman that was an outcast, she goes into the city, and she shares Jesus with others, and the whole city ends up believing in Jesus because of this woman who was an outcast, who was transformed by Jesus, and Jesus used greatly to save an entire city. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been saving people who have been spiritually uh, thirsty and spiritually hungry, and he's been changing their lives. If Jesus would do that for a woman 2,000 years ago, would he not do that for you? that Jesus is looking at people today the same way he looked at that woman, and he says, I changed her life. I can change your life too. That to, to stop the spiritual thirst in your life, you need authentic worship of who Jesus is. To stop the spiritual hunger in your life, you need to do the will of God. The will of God is to love him, love others, and get out of your comfort zone in doing that. So uh, before the band comes back up, I just want you guys to close your eyes, and, and I just want to have a little heart-to-heart -heart with you. Okay, this is what 
I honestly want to know that some of you tonight, and I'm not going to call you out as individuals, I just want to know so I can pray for you, are some of you willing to get out of your comfort zone tonight? If there's anyone who says, you know, I stay in my comfort zone and I need to get out of it, if that's you, can I see your hand so I can just be praying for you? All right, there's a lot, a lot of hands going up, so that means we need to be praying for one another. So what I want you to do right now, I want you to talk to Jesus. That so often I think we're so busy that we just don't talk to him. So you guys talk to Jesus for a little bit, just in silence, and then I'll call the band back up. So you talk to Jesus uh, now. All right. Uh, dear Jesus, I want to thank you for tonight. Uh, thank you for going to the cross for us. Thank you for reminding us how precious we are in your eyes, that we find our identity in you, that we are truly loved more than we ever can know. Uh, dear Jesus, I pray for all of us in here that we would not be satisfied to stay in our comfort zone, but that we would get out of our comfort zone and meet you where you are calling us to go whether that's urban hope or whether that's going to the cafeteria and talking to someone that no one else will. Uh, dear Jesus, please help us to work on the spiritual hunger and the spiritual thirst we have in our lives. Allow those to be satisfied in you. And I pray as we sing this last song that we will offer this song uh, as a prayer to you that you would work with us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.